I was reading a story about a young mother who was on her way to pick up her children when she was involved in a really hard and horrible accident. Uh, and this was in the days before seatbelt laws were mandatory. The lady had a car pull out in front of her and she hit it going about 55 miles an hour. And the impact threw her into the windshield face first. And this is before there were shatterproof windshields as well. And so uh, they rushed her to the emergency room because her face was cut up so badly. There were pieces of glass from the windshield that were embedded in her skin. And it took a very gifted plastic surgeon who did countless hours and countless surgeries on her face to remove those pieces of glass. But even years later down the line, she would say there would be times when there was a shard of glass that was hidden beneath the skin that the surgeon didn't get to that would begin to work its way out. And while it was under the skin, it was no problem. But when it began to work its way out, it was a really painful experience. And this happened to her over and over throughout the course of her adult life. And so anytime that would happen, it, it was just so painful. And, and the thing that hit me as I was reading that story, I'm so thankful, number one, for seatbelts, and number two, for shatterproof windshields. But the third thing that hit me when I read that story was every one of us have hit the windshield at one point or another in our life. And, and just when we think we're over it, there's an event, there's a circumstance, there's a person that we run into that begins to work a piece of what we thought we were over back to the surface again. And it brings back to us all the pain, all the emotions that went with it. And what I've discovered and what many of you already know, that when it comes to forgiveness in the Christian life, it is a process. It is not just an event, and it oftentimes takes us much longer than we think to work through it, and it is more painful than what we could have ever imagined. And so this morning, as we prepare for what God wants to say to us, I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to where we were last week, Matthew chapter 18. As you're turning there, let me just say this. We as believers know that forgiveness is supposed to be at the heart of the Christian life. But yet, at the very same time, if we're honest with ourselves, we as Christians struggle to experience the kind of peace and joy that biblical forgiveness is supposed to bring to us. And so I have to ask the question that many of you are probably wrestling with as well. Why is it that we as Christians who know that forgiveness is at the heart of our relationship with God struggle so much with it when it comes to applying it to the people around us? And what I've found out is that many of us operate with an unbiblical view of what forgiveness is and what it isn't. And if we ever hope to move forward in our relationship with God, and folks, here's, here's one thing you need to understand. Unforgiveness will be an anchor that will hold you back in your relationship and in your walk with God. It will be the one thing that will hinder you from becoming more like Jesus than anything else. Why? Because the enemy knows that's a nerve that he can touch over and over and over again. And as long as he can keep it irritated, he will keep you treading in place. And so this morning, we need to find a way to help to bring healing into our relationships, not just for our relationship's sake, but for our relationship sake with our Heavenly Father. So here last week we were in Matthew 18 and Peter is listening to Jesus talk about how do you deal with a brother or a sister who has sinned against you? He's talking about relationships within the family of God. And he says, here's the process that you go through if someone has offended you or sinned against you. And so Peter's listening to that and he's got a question, he's got a person in his mind because there's an issue that Peter is wrestling with and so he comes back to Jesus and he asks him, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? 
That seems pretty generous, doesn't it? By today's standards, we would say, that's really generous. Most of us operate on the principle of three strikes and you're out. And Jesus' answer to Peter's question, and it is a difficult question, is a straight answer. And it's a straight answer we all need to hear. And Jesus said to him, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. And literally in the Greek, it can be translated as seven times 77. That equals a tough, messy job. Because here's what God is saying to us this morning. When it comes to forgiveness, it's not something that you just do once and you're done with it. It's something that you are going to have to do over and over and over and over again throughout the course of your Christian life. And sometimes it's not just with different people. Sometimes it's with the same person. Now, how in the world could Jesus say something like that? Because in most of our minds, in the way the world operates today, he's, he's basically saying you as a Christian need to be a human doormat for people to walk over. And, and I don't think that's what Jesus had in mind at all. I think what Jesus had in mind were two biblical principles that lie behind this command. And number one, the first biblical principle that lies behind this command is that Jesus knew that the church would be carrying on his ministry until the time that he came back. And the one thing that God wants the church to be known for is not our judgment against sin, not being self-righteous, but the one thing that God wants the church to be and that the world needs to see is that the church is a merciful community. None of us came into a right relationship with God because we're good. Anybody? I'm going to shed this coat today. I'm going to do it early. None of us come into a right relationship with God because we're good. We come into a right relationship with God because we've been forgiven. And because we've been forgiven, you and I are supposed to be forgiving. Now, here's the second principle that lies behind this command. It reflects the nature of who God is. It reflects his heart more than anything else in Scripture that God is a merciful God and he is a forgiven God. Listen to what the Bible says in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 34. I want you to listen to this and then let me give you the background behind this passage. Moses has gone up on the mountain to meet with God. And what? we don't understand is that this is after God has verbally given them the Ten Commandments and all the instructions of the law. And then in Exodus chapter 24, God calls Moses up on the mountain and the people are down below and they're looking up at the mountain and the mountaintop looks like it's on fire. And Moses disappears into the cloud when God speaks to him and the people are down below and they're waiting. Where's Moses? When's Moses coming back? 40 days and 40 nights go by. And the people down below make the assumption, since the mountain looks like it's on fire, I bet God's killed him. God, Moses did something, and God has killed him. He's not coming back, and God's not coming back down to lead us. And so what did they do? They make a golden calf. They had just gotten the law verbally from God. They shall have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make a graven image. And they break them all. And then they throw a wild party to celebrate. And when Moses goes back down and sees what has happened, he smashes the two tablets. He takes the golden calf they have built and he burns it in fire And then he grinds what's left into a powder, spreads it on the water, and makes them drink it. And then Moses has 3,000 of the ringleaders of this rebellion put to death. 
And then he says to the people, you've blown it. Any of you ever heard that? You have blown it. It's over. I'm done with you. I'm finished. I've had it up to here. Anybody? If I were Moses, I would have said, what were you thinking? And so Moses says, I'm going to go back up and see if I can make atonement for you. And so he and God go back and forth, back and forth. And God relents. Now, if I were God, I would have done exactly what I told Moses. I'm going to finish them off and I'm going to start all over with you. Moses is going, no, not me. <laughs> and God changes his mind. He relents on his punishment. He says, I'll, I'll go with you. And Moses is so overwhelmed. Oh, thank you, God, for giving us another chance. He says, God, would you show me your glory? I, I just want to get a glimpse of your glory. And God says to Moses, you can't handle my glory. If I showed it to you all at one time, it would be too much. No man can see my face and live. But I'll tell you what I'll do, Moses. I'll pass by you, and I'll proclaim my name, and I'm going to hide you with my hand in a cleft of a rock. And after I've gone by, I'll let you see my hindsight as I keep going. So here's what Moses heard and saw. Listen to this. It, it, it's just profound. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions, and sin. When you put this passage in context, that the people had just blown it, they broke all of the commands. And the one thing God wanted to emphasize to Moses about this is who I am, this is the kind of God you serve, and God could have chosen anything. He could have said, the Lord, the Lord, holy and righteous and hater of sin. He could have said anything he wanted to. But the one thing he wanted to drive home to Moses at this point and at this time is that the Lord God is gracious, is merciful, and that he is a God who wants to forgive, wants to forgive. That blows my mind that this is what God wanted Moses to remember. And I promise you, Moses never forgot it because it's repeated over and over again throughout the Old Testament. This is who God is. And it's something that you and I should never forget either. This is who God is. And we as his church, if we want to reflect his glory to a watching world, we as a church, if we want people to understand who God is and what he's like, we've got to start with forgiveness. Because that's who God is. He's all the other things. But in this short passage, he emphasized seven attributes of his character, and they all point to his grace and to his mercy. And you're going, ah, I'm not sure I can do that. If we want an example of how to do this, and, and if we want to get a handle on what forgiveness is and what it isn't, the best place we can look is at Jesus. And if you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to flip over to the Gospel of Luke chapter 23. The Gospel of Luke chapter 23 is one of the most profound passages of Scripture because it tells us something that Jesus said that is only recorded in the Gospel of Luke and nowhere else. 
And many of the most ancient manuscripts do not include this verse, but enough do that we think it is something that Jesus said. And listen to what happens as Jesus is on the cross. It says, Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him, and when they had came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his garment. Jesus hanging on the cross with the weight of your sin and my sin and the world on him. Just having been scourged, mocked, spit on, his beard plucked out, beaten, whipped, driven through the streets, and nailed to a cross as he's hanging there with his dying breaths, Praise to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. How? How could he do that? I want us to think about two things this morning. Number one, the events that led up to Jesus saying this. Think about it. Jesus rode into Jerusalem a week before, riding on a wave of popular opinion and people's praise. But that wave came crashing pretty quick. In less than a week's time, the same crowd that is hailing him as Messiah is now crying out for his death. The religious leaderships send him through a mockery of a trial where he is condemned based on false evidence, and Pilate finds no reason to put him to death. But yet he's blackmailed by the religious leadership in order to have Jesus crucified. And all this is taking place according to Scripture. And Jesus is saying to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Did they not know what they were doing when they were putting him on trial? Did they know not what they were doing when they were mocking him, spitting on him, scourging him? Yes, they knew exactly what they were doing. But they didn't know who they were doing it to. They didn't realize who Jesus really was. Because they didn't believe him. So the second thing we've got to do is we've got to consider what is Jesus really asking God to do? What is Jesus asking God to do when he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's asking God, on the basis of my request, I want you to hold off judgment. I want you to forgive them on the basis of my request, in order that they might have the chance to repent and come to know the Messiah. That's what he's asking. So when we talk about what biblical forgiveness is and what it isn't, we've got to start, number one, with what forgiveness is not. Because a lot of us have been told, here's what you've got to do if you are going to forgive somebody and truly move forward in your walk with God and in your walk with other people. So let me give us a couple of things that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness, number one, is not approval of what others have done. When Jesus asked God to forgive them, that's not what he was asking. He's not asking God to approve of what they've done. Why? Because God hates sin. 
He loves the sinner, but he hates sin. So when we are asking someone to forgive, we're not saying that you need to approve of what they have done to you. Why? Because God would never ask us to approve of sinful behavior. And folks, anytime there is a broken relationship, anytime there is a rift, that means that someone has sinned. Number two, forgiveness is not excusing what they've done. How many of you have ever been told, oh, well, they didn't mean it? They didn't know what they were doing. Jesus was not asking God to excuse what these people were doing to him. For us to excuse something like it had never happened is to deny the hurt and the pain that is at the root of it. And folks, I want to tell you something. Until you can acknowledge that what happened to you was wrong or what you did was wrong, there is no possibility for you to begin to move forward. Listen to what Exodus 34 said. Just immediately after God proclaims to Moses, this is who I am, this is what I want you to be like and to do as a people of God, God reminds Moses. He said, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and their grandchildren and the entire family is affected even children in the third and fourth generation. Later on in the Old Testament, God says, I'll punish everybody for their own sins. So here's what God is saying. God's saying, I'm not asking you to excuse their sin because I don't excuse sin. You see, to forgive somebody does not always remove the consequences of their actions. Sometimes, those consequences flow from generation to generation. When we make wrong decisions, when we make sinful choices, there are consequences. God may forgive the sin, but he doesn't always remove the consequences. Sometimes the consequences of sinful behavior is a broken relationship, and sometimes that broken relationship ends up being something that goes unrepaired for a long time long time. And there's families sitting here today, sitting here today, who are suffering the consequences of sinful decisions generation after generation. Your children and their children's children have no relationships. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Here's something else forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not justifying what they did. Do you know what the word justify means? It means to declare right or just. God never declares sin right or just. The only way he can declare sin forgiven is because of what Jesus did. So he's not asking us to say, well, that's okay. I forgive you. No, it's not okay. I forgive you despite the fact that it's not okay. It's a choice you make. You choose to forgive. You're not choosing to justify what they did wrong. Here's the other thing it's not. Forgiveness is not pardoning what they did. There's been a lot of hubbubaloo in the news about President Trump and for pardoning people and even pardoning himself, you know, if he could go that far. He said, but I'd never do it. I'd never pardon myself. What is a pardon? A pardon is forgiving or acquitting the sinner in the sinful action. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You can forgive somebody, but you cannot pardon them of their sin. The only one who can do that is God. And so what is God asking you to do for by forgiving, he's not asking you to pardon him. He's asking you to leave the judgment in his hands. Let God be the judge. Forgiveness is also not refusing to take sin seriously. 
Have you ever tried to pretend that didn't hurt? You know, I played football, played sports all my life, and there were a lot of times I was hurt. And I'd bounce back up like, that didn't hurt. I'm indestructible. We do that in the emotional realm too, don't we? Someone sins against us, cheats on us, lies to us, does us wrong. And we try to bounce back and pretend, ah, that didn't hurt. Folks, can I tell you something? You will never truly heal and you'll never be able to forgive until you acknowledge the pain that that person caused you. And the first place you've got to do that is with you and God. That's where you take your pain. That's where you take your hurt. You take it to God. Why don't I say this? God takes your sin seriously. To pretend that it didn't hurt you or it didn't drive a wedge in the relationship is to whitewash it and expect it to go away. God did not whitewash your sin. He redwashed your sin with the blood of Jesus. That's what it took. That's what it took for him to take your sin seriously. It took the blood of Jesus. So why would God ask us to do something different? Listen to what the Bible says, Ephesians 1, 7. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the richnesses of his grace. That's taking sin seriously. Forgiveness is not pretending that you weren't hurt. Forgiveness is not forgetting. How many of you have ever been told, well, forgive and forget? Can I promise you something? Even though God takes your sins and he casts them into the sea of forgetfulness, God does not have spiritual amnesia. And that's not what he's asking you to do, to have spiritual amnesia. Because I promise you, even if you choose to forget about it, the enemy will choose to remind you of it. Run into him at the grocery store and Satan's elbowing you in the side. There she is. Remember what she said? Remember what she did? See, even when we want to forget, it takes a supernatural ability from the Holy Spirit to be able to say, hey, Satan, I've chosen not to recall that. I choose not to go back there. I choose not to pick that corpse up and start carrying it around with me. I put it down. I don't plan on picking it up again. Some of you need to put the corpse down. Any of you parents, do I have any parents in the house? Anybody has ever been a parent? Any of you kids ever look at you in a moment of anger and defiance whether they were little kids or older kids and go, I, I hate you. That's not fair. I, I can't think of any words that hurt a parent more than for a kid to look at them and just angrily say, I hate you. But you know what? As a parent, we forgive that. Why? Because we realize they don't totally understand what they're saying. Later on, they will, when they're parents. And so don't ever lay this on your kid. I hope someday when you grow up, you have kids just like you. <laughs> and I hope they treat you just the same way you treated me. <laughs> Can I get an amen in the house? <laughs> Anybody else ever heard that? Yeah. See, forgiveness is not forgetting. 
Have you ever wondered why Jesus still has scars? You, you read the Bible in Revelation, it tells us he's known by his scars. In John, in other Gospels, when Jesus appeared to his disciples, he what? Showed him his hands and his side. All of you have scars. Scars are to remind you where you've been, not where you're going. That's why you don't forget. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember what happened there. But you know what? I'm not going back. I'm going forward. Let's go forward. Here's the last one that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Ooh. You know why? Because it takes two to reconcile. You can forgive somebody, but if they don't ever acknowledge that they did anything wrong, it's impossible to reconcile. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you number one, you've got to be reconciled with God first before you can ever be reconciled with somebody else. So reconciliation is not always an end result of forgiving somebody. Here's why. Some people are toxic. There's some people who are toxic, and for you to stay in a relationship with them would be wrong because they're not going to change. And you know what? You forgive being fully aware of what they did. You forgive so that you can move forward with God, and if God somehow brings them around, then maybe somewhere in the future there's a chance for reconciliation. Let's talk about what forgiveness is. And, and I'll be quick. Forgiveness is being aware of the sin and still forgiving them. It's not pretending it didn't happen. It's not ignoring it. It's being fully aware this is what happened. This is the hurt and the pain that it's caused, but yet, because I've been forgiven, I will be forgiving. Forgiveness is refusing to punish. If you're going to forgive somebody, you've got to remove the fear of punishment. In the Gospel, in the First John, it says that perfect love drives out fear. Why? Because fear is always associated with punishment. And if you're going to forgive somebody, you've got to remove the fear of punishment. And some people say, I don't know if I can do that. Why? We don't trust God to take care of things. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Revenge is not your area. That's God's. If you're going to forgive, you've got to remove the fear of punishment. Here, here's a third one, and this is one I think that Christians really wrestle with. Forgiveness is choosing not to keep score. I think when Jesus told Peter, you've got to forgive people 70 times 7, he was going, all right, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I, I, I've already done that 14 times. <laughs> you know, and so he's subtracting that from his total. What's the Bible say? Love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love keeps no record of wrongs. If you're going to forgive somebody, you cannot keep what they did in the, in the closet of your mental memory and, so you can keep dragging it back out. You're going, look what you did. So you can remind them all over again. Look what you did, but I forgave you. The next time something goes wrong, they drag it back out. Look what you did, but I forgave you. No. Forgiveness is choosing not to keep score. Forgiveness is also not telling what they did. Okay, everybody do this. There's a right place and a wrong place to pour out your pain.
Number one, you take it to the Father. That's what Jesus did. He took the pain to the Father. And number two, there is a safe place and a right way to exercise your pain, and that's usually with a trusted counselor or a friend who is a confidant that you know it's not going anywhere else. So do this. Oh, come on. Participate with me. Do this. Now everybody do this. Monkey, speak no evil. Monkey, listen to no evil. Why? Because the book of Proverbs says something really strong about that. Proverbs 17, verse 9. Listen to what it says. If you keep talking about what happened, you have no hope of reconciling. You have no hope of moving forward. Listen to what the Bible says, and it's powerful. It says, you will keep your friends if you forgive them, but you will lose your friends if you keep talking about what they did wrong. I like that translation, common English version. Because it makes the point. Here's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is being gracious and merciful. Remember what I said? We, we don't talk about what they did. See, being gracious is not talking about what they did, even if what you say is true. Why? Because in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said this, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall what? Receive mercy. Have you ever noticed that if you keep adding wood to a fire, it does what? It keeps burning. If you keep adding verbal woodage to a fire and to a conflict, it will keep going. But if you quit adding to it by being gracious, not saying something, even though it's true. And, and I've got some people in my life that pride themselves on speaking the truth and nothing but the truth. But it's rarely spoken in love. And it's rarely spoken to help me improve. I was reading William Barclay, who is a con biblical commentator, old time, you know, and, and he's been dead for a century. Yeah, well, yeah, probably close to a century. But he said this. He said, forgiveness must take place in the heart or it's worthless. Writing his commentary on Hebrews where he said, if it's possible, so far as it concerns you, be at peace with all men. This is the verse he's commentating on. And he said, forgiveness has to take place in the heart or it's worthless. Why? Because if it doesn't take place in the heart, it will flow out of the mouth. That's what Jesus said, Matthew 12, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks so maybe you're here this morning and maybe you're struggling wrestling with somebody in your past somebody who maybe even be dead and gone you're wrestling with forgiving them and you have been carrying their corpse since the day the casket lid was closed and there's others of you here today who have been wrestling with somebody in the present. Somebody who's hurt you, betrayed you, done you wrong. And, and the relationship is still broken because you cannot let go. You have not chosen to forgive. Folks, I'm going to tell you, sometimes it takes supernatural help to do it. Because we cannot just make a decision of the will and say, I, I forgive and I'm moving on. Otherwise, Jesus would say, forgive them once and, and keep going. He said, no, 70 times 7. It takes supernatural help to do that. So how did, how did Jesus do it? He trusted God with it. You know what I think 
your number one problem with forgiving somebody is? You want God to treat people like you would. Our number one issue and why we struggle so much with this is that our ability to forgive is directly tied to our pride. How did Jesus do it? Jesus surrendered his pride to the Father on a daily basis. And so when it came to forgiving them from the cross, it was no problem. His pride was laid aside. And if you want to forgive people, you've got to put your pride to death. And I said, our greatest mistake when it comes to forgiving is we want people to treat, we want God to treat people like us. We want our pound of flesh. We want payback. We want to see them suffer the way we've suffered. I'm so thankful Jesus didn't ask God that. And see, the, the problem is, is that we don't trust God to be just. Jesus said, the Bible says God is merciful and he's gracious, but he's also just. You know what that means? It means that God, because he's gracious and merciful, he wants to forgive. But because he's just, he has to punish our sin. So how do you reconcile those two things? The answer is Jesus. In Jesus, God was able to be gracious and merciful to you because he took your punishment. And see, as long as you expect God to be like you, you'll never move forward because God wants you to be like him. We want God to be like us. God wants us to be like him. Do you know what? God will never be like us. Thank you. But we can be like him. But you have to choose. You have to choose. And sometimes the hardest thing to do is to choose to trust God with your pain Sometimes the hardest thing you'll ever have to do is to release your right to be offended and, and place that in God's hands and trust that He will do the right thing always and then refuse to look back in the rearview mirror of your life. Refuse to go back to that place and keep looking forward by faith. When we trust God, not just with our sins, but the sins of the past, we find freedom. Why? Because then we begin to understand what forgiveness is all about. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe there's somebody here today God is speaking to. Maybe there's a corpse you need to bury at the feet of Jesus today. Maybe there's a piece of glass that has come to the surface recently that is hurting you. It's incapacitating you. And you need the Holy Spirit to help you surgically remove that. Maybe there's somebody here today that the wounds and the pain are so fresh that you don't know if there's any possible way you can do what Jesus is asking. I'm encouraging you to pour your pain out to Him. He can be trusted. He's a healer. and He will help you if you'll let Him. But you have to choose. You have to choose to put your pride to death. You have to choose to trust Jesus with it all. You got to surrender it to Him.
you choose. Lord, right now, help us to choose you. Help us to choose hope and a future. Help us to do what we cannot do on our own, which is forgive. I want to ask that you quietly stand to your feet. Is God speaking to you this morning? This altar is a place of business between you and the Lord. It's a place where decisions are confirmed and they're nailed down. And God wants you to walk out of here today right with Him. Number one, right with Him. He's already paid for your pardon. He's already ready to justify and declare you righteous. But you got to let Him. You got to ask Him. And the tough stuff, you got to continue to ask Him over and over and over again. And when the enemy reminds you about what they did or didn't do, or wouldn't do, you just got to keep reminding him, I chose to forgive them again and again. 